Hello, everyone. Welcome to AMT's Tech Trends Podcast, where we discuss the latest manufacturing technology research and news. I am the Director of Technology, Benjamin Moses, and I'm here with... Stephen Lamarca, Technology Analyst. Steve, today's episode is sponsored by AM Radio. Yes, sir. AM Radio is the new podcast from Additive Manufacturing Media. Join editors Pete Zielinski, Stephanie Hendrickson, and Julia Heider as they share stories of companies succeeding with 3D printing today. Talk about emerging trends and discuss the future opportunities and potential for AM in the context of the larger manufacturing landscape. New episodes are published every other week. Subscribe now on Apple or wherever you listen to podcasts. Tune into Additive. Thanks, Steve. Before we get into some articles and some of the nitty gritty of the content, uh, Blade Show occurred. Blade Show. Knives. I totally forgot about it, man. <laughs> I did. I, I, Sam, uh, ran across it when uh, a couple of the YouTube channels I follow ta- started talking about some of the knives, and I thought, wow, I completely forgot about this. Yeah, yeah. I only found out about it or was reminded of it because of uh, a few of the gun tubers that I follow <laughs> on YouTube yep. were there. Yep. Deepa gives me the hairy eyeball when I watch some of the gun tubers. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I, I, I feel that. Every, sometimes I give myself the hairy eyeball when I watch the gun tubers. I mean, some of them are a little bit extreme. Yeah. But I tell you what, one cool thing, I, I, I had two cool things that I would want to talk about for Blade Show. I forgot one of them. Um, but uh, one thing I really like about that, that I would be interested in seeing at Blade Show, better yet, materials. Sure. One of the coolest things to nerd, one of the easiest things to nerd out about when talking about pocket knives with other people that need some sun and like talking about pocket knives is blade steels. That's right. And, and, and blade materials. Right. Whether it's, you know, high carbide like ceramic blends with that just used metal as a binder for the ceramics and the carbides in the blade. Or just, you know, your run-of-the-mill powder metallurgy that, you know, pocket knife people think nothing of, but it's kind of a big deal in our industry yep. where uh, powdered metals are all are what's up in additive. Yep. But one of my favorite things is, you know, you can't look at a high-end pocket knife without seeing CPM S90V sure. or CPM D2 even for, you know, a, a, a lower rent knife. Or C, my favorite, CPM 20CV, which is the CPM American competitor to Bowler M390. But anyway, CPM stands for uh, Crucible Powder Metallurgy. It might be Crucible part, uh, Particulate Metallurgy, but I'm pretty sure it's powder. We'll go with powder. Anyway, Crucible, they're like the premier company when yep. it comes to powdered steel knife steels. Right. And... They were bought a couple of years ago because all they focus on is pocket knives. And seriously, how big is that industry? Right. I mean, a lot of us in that industry like to spend too much money <laughs> on things that we use to open cardboard boxes and Amazon packages with. But that industry is not that big. That's fair. Even though, you know, you and I spend like way more than we should admit spending on a stupid pocket knife. Correct. Um, I mean, even if Victoria Knox, like, uh, a, a Swiss Army knife is way overpriced for what it is, <laughs> but still way cheaper than what you and I probably have in our pockets. Fair. And Crucible, like because they have, they're a niche industry. They, they they do really awesome stuff for a small niche industry that is fed financially by a bunch of nerds. <laughs> they were go spiraling kind of downhill. Yeah. And this other company comes along that we know about, especially the guys from AM Radio know about because they sponsor them, um, Carpenter. Yeah. Carpenter steals. They buy up Crucible. And we're like, you guys are going to keep doing your pocket knife thing, but we're also using your powdered metals for oh, additive. That's awesome. It is the coolest thing. It's probably one of my favorite little stories of the additive industry. There's a couple of reasons why I like these uh, <laughs> sector shows. Uh, yeah. So Blade Show is one of them. Um, Shot Show is another one for uh, firearms, and there's a bunch of other uh, defense-related stuff. But the reason I like these is because a lot of people gloss over – they look at the final product. Mm -hmm. They gloss over the heavy manufacturing involved in those sectors. So like Heat treatments. Exactly. Blade Show is a very good example of – it's just manufacturing. It's the art and science of manufacturing. You have a cool design. How do you manufacture it? Every facility that we've ever toured that does – Metal working, mm-hmm. which is 99% of them. 
they can all be repurposed to make pocket knives. <laughs> yeah. And that's the thing. All it's, of them. You'll see higher end knives that are more handmade. And for, do the entire process. And for the most part, the ones that we're talking about are more uh, machine driven. I would still say it's handmade because you take these talented machinists okay. that are appreciated, but probably not given as much appreciation as they deserve, right. who on their free time with some downtime on the machine and some money or, or some material that they hopefully paid for out of pocket. And like, I'm going to machine myself a sweet pocket knife. Yeah. And like I'm going to design it and I'm going to throw it up and then I'm going to machine it on this fancy machine. Cause I can't do it on my, with my bare hands. <laughs> I mean, I could, but right. it's going to, you've seen that show on Netflix that where they make knives. Oh, dude, those knives, I'm sorry, that show, those knives that they make look like junk. Those are not good. Get, get a machinist yep. that, like, you know, uses a CNC machine, uh, an expensive high-end, or not even a high-end, man. Just any CNC machine on their free time to make themselves a pocket knife. Mm -hmm. They show it to any of these pocket knife nerds at Blade Show. They're going to be like, I'll take three. <laughs> it's a th well, Oh, well, I can't make them all the time. It's like, name your price. Yeah. I'll take three. And the cutting edge stuff I'm looking for, and there's been a couple of use cases, is uh, when we talk about additive getting into blades it may the cost of it may be prohibitive at this point but you know bimetal applications we've talked yeah. about oh my god different yeah. varying the material through the blade itself and i see that kind of a new niche trend in um in knives yeah i just, it is really cool that the little knife makers are really taking off yeah and you look at a lot of them they're all like all of the 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 the, the boutique knife manufacturers are machinists yeah they're Absolutely. machinists that saw opportunity by people willing to buy pocket knives. <laughs> Good for them. And they took off. It's yeah. amazing. Very entrepreneurial industry. Yeah. Good for them. Can we get us our article? Yeah, absolutely. I'm ready. The first that was one a good that, dude, that was a good warm up. I like that. I love some love some knives also. Yes. Tell me tell me your first article. Uh, how AR fits into industry 4.0. So we talked about augmented reality quite a bit. Yeah, we have. And this article gives us a little more something tangible also. Uh, so there's four, uh, three areas uh, that I want to talk about. Uh, one is, you know, the technology behind AR. What does the actual projection look like? Mm -hmm. So there's two main scenarios you see. One are kind of the uh, a projector, or it's called spatial AR. So if you're wearing glasses, it's projecting on into the inside of the lens. Which okay. That's a use case. Um, you know, where that sits in the industry, that's here or there. But there's also um, computer-based AR. So if you imagine using like a tablet or some other device where it has a camera and you're uh, using the screen or an HMI interface uh, to depict the environment. And uh, the latter is probably more prevalent than the uh, former, uh, probably just because of cost. Um, you know, g using um, AR glasses, uh, it's probably a little more expensive versus the value of just going to a tablet or a computer-based device. Uh, so that's the first thing is figure out, you know, what is the projection source, or how do you want to project? Absolutely. Uh, the second is maintenance. Maintenance still comes up as a, a very um, a value add use case. Not maintenance of the AR technology no, no. itself. Using, Ma using AR for maintenance. Correct. Correct. And there's a couple of scenarios that they talk about in the article. One is um, uh, annotating the device itself. So if you're working on a big machine, you know where is uh, power cord A, or where is the box that you need to access. You know, using AR to figure out where you are in relation to some of these big machines, mm -hmm. uh, that's one scenario, right? So having the information of um, and what you're looking for being shown to you. And there's the common use case of, we'll call it a conference call. So I'm from working on a machine, and I need an expert, right? I'm the doer, but I need someone that's got 30 years experience. They're probably not going to be at the facility. Like if I need to work on a uh, yeah. CNC mill, I need to contact the OEM for that mill. And the OEM is going to charge you to right. ship somebody out to exactly. fix it for you. When I have a maintenance attack here, why can't I just have them communicate? So being able to communicate through your AR devices to either annotate the, the field or uh, just being able to see what the technician sees is significantly valuable. I mean, just like when I when I used to place orders, just telling placing an order by telling them my credit card information. <laughs> That is the worst way to communicate, you know. So being able to visually transfer the information, I mean, that's the whole point of, you know, basically a visual conference call is being able to uh, transfer the information uh, much uh, smoother. Yeah. Uh, so they also get into um, uh, assembly. Uh, so being able to project, you know, what needs to be connected to where and showing the 
you know, the orientation or uh, the object itself uh, in the future state. So, you know, if you're assembling like a, a cable harness, you know, which wires go into the connector, a lot of those are still very, very difficult to assemble. Uh, even if you have your alternate is a big piece of paper, right? You have a sheet of paper hanging over your table. You know, you probably can get away with uh, using some type of AR to augment that and visually enhance that, right? So are you, are you going to print a color uh, D-sized drawing for every single connector you need to connect? Mm. Or do you uh, embed all the information in AR? So I thought that's a very um, interesting use case. And I see that prevalent. So um, you see that occurring a lot more on larger assemblies and more complex assemblies. Um, the other side is human to robot collaboration. And I see this growing mm. a little bit more. So they talk about um, uh, uh, the aim of improving productivity uh, and efficiency. So being able to control the robot and seeing what the robot sees through the glasses or through the tablet or through the device. Uh, and then controlling that machine uh, through what the machine sees, basically. Uh, we've seen, I've seen a couple of use cases where uh, basically tell a remote into the robot for troubleshooting. Um, so they are, uh, a couple of companies are doing like wow. renting um, cells and they are promising that if the machine has trouble, they'll get flagged and they have a big command center where one guy is monitoring 30, 40 cells. So if one goes down, he just remotes in, fix that issue and then remotes back out and then allows it to continue and he watches the other machines when Dude, they're down. an on-call technician mm -hmm. could work from home. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, the scenario that this company talked about, this one company is watching, one guy is watching, you know, 30, 40 sales at 30, 40 different companies, right? There's no need for him to be, he, you know, he's troubleshooting one every, you know, couple of minutes, every couple of hours, right? So yeah. being able to scale, um, and, and this is the common theme for automation, right? One person is doing, the, when they get an automation, one person is doing multiple things. So I think they've escalated that quite a bit. So I thought this is a very good look at, uh, where we sit and the potential of AR. Not everyone's going to have AR in their facility, sure. But everyone could have the potential. Uh, look at maintenance, a service tech. Even if you call a service tech, they might be communicating back to the OEM uh, to help repair machines. So um, that was a good, good little article on. Uh, I AR. think I think the industry will certainly come back to AR. Yeah, it's kind of gone stagnant and gone cold, but it's definitely a back burner right. and not totally mothballed. Right, because. Automation, as I've said this a million times, automation is foundational yep. to the development of the industry. And there will be a robot in every facility. Right. And event which means eventually there will be a vision system <laughs> in every facility. And once there's a robot and a vision system in every facility, you don't have to do too much more to get AR. Yeah. And it doesn't especially have to be, like like a drone AR. Yeah, and it doesn't have to be a vision system specifically for that robot doing uh, those tasks, right? right? You could have a cell controller but it helps. using a vision for the whole cell just in case you have to troubleshoot yeah, or a camera. Yeah, so awesome. See, if you've got an article on additive. Dude, I got second? two articles on additive, but I'm going to treat them as one. Do it. So um, first off, PR Newswire uh, released either earlier this week or last week, um, Syaki's electron beam additive manufacturing, EBAM, <laughs> Uh, surpasses 40 pounds of titanium per hour, making it the highest deposition rate in the world for industrial metal 3D printing. Wow. That's I don't cool. really need – we don't need to discuss that anymore. This is a world <laughs> record. Sayaki did it. Right. Um, that's the machine they did it with, the technology they did it with. Titanium, 40 pounds of titanium per hour. That's a large volume. It is a large volume. Now, titanium – it's a light metal. Right. It's a lighter metal. It's not aluminum. Yep. But like 40 pounds of titanium an hour, that's effectively like you're coming from the wine industry. The average wine box is 40, 50 pounds. Right. Or box of wine, 12 bottles of wine. Um, that's like growing a box <laughs> of wine every hour. Right. right. In titanium. That's pretty cool. It is. That is a lot of volume. Yep. Um, and... And to be fair, this is on the machine's like highest speed. So if sure. you look at some of the pictures in the article, the the finish, the surface finish is like non-existent. Right. But they're th they're just trying to throw down material. Yeah. Like that, like this looks like three D printing that was done in the eighties. It's that kind <laughs> of quality. But as we all know, there's like a slider in additive. Right. You either go for speed. Well, 
the more the further uh, the closer to speed you go, the more you prioritize speed, the more finish suffers. And the more you prioritize finish, the more speed suffers. And I'll I'll play the devil's advocate to that because I think we've gotten very complacent about uh, accepting a high surface finish for a design part. So in the end, you know, if you have those rough surface tech uh, fixture uh, surface finishes on the outside, so you have those large um, circular uh, edges. The question I was asked, you know, if it's not an interface or if something's not rubbing on it, can the design live with that? You know, does this does those intersections of those uh, um, circular points create a ses- stress concentration? Yes. If it doesn't, if it's perfectly acceptable, you know, I think one thing may the industry may want to get comfortable with is accepting a more rough or more uh, non uh, finished, uh, non finished, non machined uh, surface texture. And I think you know, you know, you're talking about internal cavities and things like that. That that may make sense. So. I would definitely start seeing uh, more boundaries being pushed on what is acceptable sure. from that industry. Sure. And my, my, my next article to supplement this um, came from CNET, actually. Wow. You know, Every now and then we have CNET on here sure. doing something manufacturing related. This one's really cool. GM 3D prints 60,000 parts to keep Tahoe deliveries on time. Now That's a lot of parts. That is a lot of parts. That's mass production for a mass production vehicle and a consumer, like a, a civilian vehicle at that. So there is a caveat. Um, number one, kudos to GM. Sure. This is kind of big. Everybody's been hit by uh, delays mm-hmm. and supply chain issues. I am so sick of hearing that stuff. <laughs> and finally, just like during the lows of the pandemic – Additive was our savior, sure. making those ventilators and, and PPE and stuff like that. G got you know, good for you, GM. Good for you, Additive, for coming up with a cool story out of this. Because sixty thousand parts is nothing to scoff at. Each yep. Tahoe requires two, so this is thirty thousand Tahoes that they've supported with Additive. Um, it does mention a. Uh, no, I'm not going to talk about the machines used. I'm pretty sure it was HP MultiJet Fusion 3D printers, which is just MultiJet Fusion is HP's name for high speed sintering. Sure. Um, but uh, I, I, I'm, I can't be. I'm not so sure. Um, but what's big? What's a big deal about this is I don't think Chevy or any auto manufacturer would have done this with mm. any other vehicle. It is impressive that we are talking about a available to civilian vehicle sure. here. Yeah, you know, if 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 the DoD was doing something like this for the Hummer, it would still be a cool story. Not the Hummer, but what, what's that new thing called? The MRAP. MRAP. Yeah. You know, it would still be a cool story, but it'd be like, yeah, well, they've got the big funds of the right. DoD breathing down their neck. Of course, they can make this happen. But Chevy's doing this not just for like the government, mm-hmm. but for a civilian vehicle. And CNET, of course, is reporting on it as if it's a civilian vehicle, which the Tahoe is. Right. But we have to remember that in the United States, uh, motor vehicles have to be supported by their OEs, their o- OEMs, for up to 10 years after the final model of that generation stops production. Yep. So let's say this Tahoe, um, it stopped production in 2023. Right. If it was a regular civilian vehicle, that means GM isn't allowed to stop making produ- uh, replacement parts for it until 2033. Yep. However, the Tahoe isn't just any normal civilian vehicle. Yes, it's available to civilians, but it's a it it is designed it is a la carte designed by the U.S. government and state governments, mm-hmm. for that matter, uh, to be used as a government vehicle, mm-hmm. both for police and military and, and, and government. I'm not going to stop saying government. I'm repeating myself a lot. <laughs> but um, government vehicles have to be treated differently. Government vehicles have to be supported by their OEM for 25 years. Wow. So they plan on supporting this thing with additive technology <laughs> for mass production 25 years after they stop producing the final model. That's pretty cool. That's wild. That's this good. is a big deal. I talk a lot of smack about GM. <laughs> I'm not done talking smack about GM, but dude, they're 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 finding some positives. 
And that's a good point. You bring out the life of the part, and you know that's something I never really considered uh, that you know they'll continue the manufacturing process uh, for the life of the part, and that's going to be a lot of parts in the long run. So yeah, thanks, Steve. That's a really good article. You bet. I've got one from Quali Mag, one of several, uh, about flaw detection. So you know we've been talking about uh, additive for quite a while, and we talk about defects and additive, but taking a step back, um, this article from Quali Mag gives the fundamentals of what is a flaw, what is a rejection, things like that. And it, it, there are fine lines, and uh, it'll piggyback off my uh, article later on. But uh, I thought this is a very good look and a step back of what we consider a flaw versus what we consider rejection. So first is what is the definition? And also, I think it's very important uh, for me to convey that uh, you know within manufacturing, nothing is flawless. Right. You can always zoom in more and always find a, a flaw. Let's <laughs> let's call it a, a flaw for now. Um, so nothing in the world is flawless. Uh, and the prof and the article goes over the proper definition of flaw is indication which is determined to be a discontinuity, but does not exceed rejection limits. If it exceeds rejection limits, then it's a defect. So there's a a, a thing that someone notices. Gotcha. And if it's within the limits, eh, you just let it be. But if it's not, then obviously then it gets escalated to a defect. So I thought that that's completely fair because you know, if you look at a machine part and you see, if you see a hairline, we'll call it flaw, that could be allowable. So you know, back to our uh, you know point about additive and what we consider uh, flaws versus uh, rejects. Um, and they, they also go over a couple of groups. One is an inherent flaw. One is a primary process. One is secondary process. One is service. So starting backwards, a service flaw would be as you're using the part, you know, there could be a, a crack or a, a flaw uh, developing how you use the part. A secondary process is something developed in the uh, uh, manufacturing process that we would describe in the uh, discrete manufacturing world. If you're machining a part and you detect a flaw there. Uh, primary process refers to uh, the raw material processing. Um, so if you're doing like uh, cold forming or mm. creating the bar or the ingot. Uh, and then here is basically how you're producing the part. It's, there's always going to be some type of uh, flaw. Uh, and then it gets in different techniques. So I thought this is a really good overview of we're still handling raw materials, still handling uh, machine parts. Well, subtractive manufacturing will never go away. When you talk about additive, it is 3D printing plus subtractive. Uh, so the idea of what is a flaw versus a defect, I think uh, we could definitely be more descriptive about that in the industry. I like it. Steve, is the next one you have on F-22? It is. It is. Let's do it. Because I was kind of waiting for you to talk about, you know, the, the flaw detection, stuff like that, but yeah. also go into um, uh, non-destructive testing. That's coming up. But, I'll, okay, I'll let, we'll talk about the stealth-coded F-22, and then you can talk about all the testing that goes into <laughs> making sure that coding is working all right. Yep. But, all right, admittedly, I saw, like, I feel like two weeks ago now, um, Top Gun Maverick. Congratulations. I loved it. It was incredible. <laughs> I will go back and see it again. Go Tom Cruise. Dude, I'm, I'm not going to say all of that, but I'm going to say go modern filmmaking and uh, a minimal use of CGI. Yeah. And I do like practical effects. And go fifth generation fighters uh, and fourth generation. You know, We don't leave out the F-18s. After all, they were the star of the show. But I'm not, I don't want to spoil anything. Um, okay, so... This article came up, I think, a while back. Anyway, the F-22 Raptor is testing NGAD 6th generation fighter tech. Let me explain NGAD. Well, let me explain the F-22 first. Yes. Um, there are 187 operational F-22 Raptors. Yep. It doesn't sound a lot for somebody like myself that doesn't know any better about uh, fighter jets yep. and air superiority technology. Actually, 187 is a lot. Sure. There's a lot of fighter jets, right. um, especially the best of the best F-22s. Um, the F-22 is the U.S.'s primary fifth-generation air superiority fighter-slash-tactical jet. Yep. Um, Can I interrupt real quick? Yes. So it is different than the F-35. It is different from the F-35. There are right. going to be a lot more F-35s, right. but the F-35 also is a fifth-generation Military jet. Yep. Um, the F-22 was developed a little earlier than the F-35. And yeah. The F-35 is meant to be used across multiple um, 
uh, branches of the uh, armed forces. Right. If you had to compare the F-35 and the F-22 to, like, Ferraris, <laughs> like, your 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 F-35 is, like, you know, what, whatever the new, the current V-8 one is. Sure. I'll, I'll say the 458 Italia. Okay. You know, special. It's special. It's expensive. But it's mass-produced. And yep. they made it for all of the branches. Right. The F twenty two is like the Ferrari La Ferrari. <laughs> yeah. It's it's like their prim, premium hypercar. Yep. And it oh, it's also so special that um, there are one hundred eighty seven of them operational and only in the U S. And the government straight up put a law to all of the uh, onto the F twenty two saying you, we're not allowed like to all the government contractors right. you're not allowed to sell this to anybody That's else right. only this is only know. staying in the US yeah. it's not going to anybody continue please okay continuing um the only opposition to the F22 and F35 <laughs> um the only opposition the only other fifth generation aircraft out there um that could put up a fight to the F22 and like barely I, i'm being generous sure. um is the Russian Su-57 right. and all of its derivatives. Like, right. the chi- China has a derivative of it. Um, but the, the Su-57 felon. I mean, it looks cool. It is cool. I've flown it in ace combat because, you know, that means a lot. Um, but the Russian Su-57, there are six of them. Right. <laughs> I think they, there's actually, like, 16, but there's 10 experimental, right. like, for testing purposes, to which... Uh, the U.S. only needed eight <laughs> testing versions, yep. um, but uh, but there's only six operational. So I mean, there's that. <laughs> even, even if it could put up a fight, sure, it'll be quick. It would be six <laughs> versus 187. <laughs> um, but uh, what's funny about this? So the S- Su-57 is a thing, though, right? And it is a blip on the F-22's radar, and just the fact that there's a potential threat or even the slightest competition with the 5th gen F22 the US being the US wants to upgrade the F22 to a 6th gen fighter with the NGAD next generation air dominance program <laughs> we are so good at spending money i love it um love but you. yeah you know it gets me mad like you know come tax season but oh my god right now i love it yep. um which would develop the F22 into the super raptor because if, if the Raptor isn't cool enough, now we're calling it the Super Raptor. But uh, yeah, this was just a fun article yeah. talking about it. Uh, and it made me, I wanted to bring up this this article, this news item uh, for two reasons that we will get into later in the article. Yep. But the first one, uh, the first segue being, you know, this is a stealth fighter. Yep. So there is so much demand going into testing the integrity of the coatings on these fighters, including the F-35. Two, um, one of the versions of the NGAD F-22 has been, has gotten some spy shots on it, and it looks like they have sort of like painted it chrome. Oh, So stealth fighters, since I have been baby, and my dad took me on the Tidal Basin in DC once, and we saw this bat wing flying above, and, (laughs) and you know, we went home and and my dad was like, that was a B-2 bomber. Yeah. We saw a B-2 bomber fly overhead. And it was incredible. I'll never forget that. I was like five. Right. And But anyway, stealth coatings are dark and they're matte in color. Right. And it's effectively shifted the auto industry to going matte and dark. Sure. So you see all these high-end cars like Porsches, Mercedes-Benz. Ferraris in some cases, that's a shame. You see, even the Ferrari Formula One car currently has yeah. a matte paint job and yeah. it's disgusting. Yeah. Um, and people think it's cool. Anyway, <laughs> that was everybody think all these dummies think it's cool because of the F-22 and the F-35 and the sure. B-2 bomber and the F-117 Nighthawk because yep. they're matte and dark and sleek looking with all of these angles and totally inspiring Lamborghini for everything that they're going to do for the next two decades. Sure. Um, F-22 NGAD prototype was just spotted a second time. First time it was spotted was in November, had a chrome paint job. It was shiny, yeah. shined bright like a diamond. <laughs> it was just spotted again yeah. like two weeks ago with a, a, a second one uh, with another chrome paint job. We're going to watch a shift so hard from matte 
paint jobs to chrome paint jobs. It's not even – next 20 years <laughs> of our existence, yep. chrome if the world done. lasts that long, <laughs> um, chrome paint jobs on cars. That's gross. Because of – <laughs> Be- because of the F-22 and the NGAD program and stuff like that. But I also want to segue that because I'll get into later a thing on the ban on Chromium 6, which has been recently brought to my extension. But you give us some articles first before I got we one. get to that. I got one on non-destructive testing trends of 22. So this is, again, last one I have from Quality uh, Mag. And it, the thing about non-destructive testing is fascinating because – Obviously, there's a lot of science behind that, yeah. but it still comes down to a human making an interpretation based on what they see. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it gets into some of the trends that they're seeing. One is, just like everyone else in the world, they have workforce issues. They have an aging workforce that's leaving and a young force that's coming in, and they just don't know how to uh, uh, merge the two. Uh, they're having issues with uh, some of the older workforce uh, leaving just because they don't want to adapt to new changes to either new technology or processes. And a lot of the companies uh, noted in the article are having issues retaining the younger f- workforce because to get to a level two, level three requires a fair amount of investment and experience and training that once uh, they're trained up, then they have the opportunity to leave however they feel. Um, so it's an interesting trend on you know generational workforce and the perception of loyalty to the company. Uh, so I thought that was a, the first point. Uh, there is one upside to the um, current workforce issues. There's a greater percentage of women entering the workforce yes. for non-destructive oh, yeah. inspectors. So I, I, anytime that uh, we have uh, growing demographics in that area, I think that's definitely a positive. Uh, what, what, do, you, do you have any percentages? I got no percentages. Okay, no, that's fine. No. Uh, so that's interesting, though. The last one, uh, not the last one, but one of the other ones is level three inspectors. So this is the... The chief of the chief at, oh. your, at your facility, right? That's your fifth generation fighter of inspection <laughs> people. So they're going to help not only set up processes, but also oversee all the level ones, level twos to make sure quality of work is going through, making sure they pass audits, making sure if they want to bring in a new type of equipment, the level three is going to help uh, support that. Um, and there's issues in um, getting uh, enough people uh, trained high enough for that level three experience. Because it, you know, the certain number of hours that they're either doing training or being trained by someone. So, the the level of requirement to achieve a level three, it's the barrier is high at this point, and they're seeing yeah. a significant uh, shortfall in um, that in your in the field. That's amazing. Uh, I have two positive trends here. One is a shift for, shift towards robotic handling for components during inspection. So a lot of these are, we'll call it subsurface inspection. Or, okay. uh, so they have to either x-ray the parts or use some other subsurface technique. So typically to get in the chamber, you, some, someone will have to reorient the part in relation to the sensors. Mm-hmm. So either the sensors are static and you move the part or the sensors can move around. There's also a call for um, surface crawling robots. Yeah. Yep. For this. Maybe yeah, you're getting that. I'm sorry. No, no, no. That'll get into a little bit later. Uh, but the ability to manipulate the part, just like material handling and subtractive manufacturing, mm-hmm. um, being able to manipulate the part to get to the shot faster. So they're using a lot more automation and robotic handling. And to your point, you know, large surfaces that do require visual inspection, like a, a wing on a jet. Yeah, or a, or a bridge. Or a bridge or a giant ship, right? You, 50 feet of wells. Who's going to inspect that? Someone's got to walk it or you can put a robot on it, yeah. a drone, and visually inspect it. Uh, that gets into some of the uh, uh, inadequacies of vision systems based on resolution, right. lighting conditions, and still um, there's standards that need to be updated to make sure um, uh, either the humans reviewing the quality or things like that. So this is uh, wild. This is also like ties back to last episode mm-hmm. where you're talking about how CMMs are starting to add another axis. Yeah, absolutely. Rotary tables. Yep. And cool. And the last point that the article talks about is digital radiography. So. The digital, so when you're x-raying a part, the best resolution you still get is actually still with a piece of film as opposed to digital radiography there. Uh, the resolution is just better. Uh, so there are significant trends in shifting da- digital radiography to be a, a better replacement. Um, and a lot of aerospace companies are uh, adopting this, and ACM standards are more are maturing fast enough to uh, allow this adoption also. So I thought overall... It kind of sucks workforce issues, but that's a common issue. But I feel like uh, non-destructive testing is one of those foundational things in a lot of manufacturing uh, facilities that does get kind of glossed over. I mean, if you're doing assemblies, like any type of weldments, this is going to be 
uh, a core part of your skill set. Yeah. And it's a fortune that, you know, and as a, there's a divide between uh, the workforce generations, but it's more of what are acceptable means uh, or different um, generational behaviors and figuring out how to adapt to those and then adopting technologies to supplement us to be more efficient. Because it is just like every other um, quality process or inspection process. It's always a pillar. Nobody likes it. But when you're inspecting wells for flight criticality, it's an important part of the process. Right. That's why. Imagine if they implemented non-destructive testing into um, automotive safety regulations. Mm -hmm. Like, do you have any idea how many more car companies we would probably see? <laughs> like, like the reason why the Italian supercar company doesn't export more Pagani Wiras into uh, the United States or around the world, for that matter, isn't just the fact that it's a one point five million dollar car, right. but uh, it's also because like we're making five of these <laughs> because we can only make five of them. Yep. We like legit can only make five of them. Right. And the U.S. wants us to crash four for safety ratings. <laughs> it makes this a one-off car. We have to make five cars to make a one-off. Yep. Automotive, <laughs> uh, the U.S. needs some uh, NDT. Well, there's, uh, there's on that side, there's a shift for uh, simulating um, failures. That, that digital twin? Yeah. Are you telling yeah. me about that digital twin, baby? So there's qualification by analysis, and that's a, aerospace has adopted that quite a bit. Um, so the shift for that into the automotive. Now, to be fair, do I do we want a hundred? Huayras rolling on the streets. Eh, I really don't. No, care. no, because half, half, mo oh, not half, but like a good mi amount of the desirability of exactly. a Huayra is its exclusivity. That yeah. there aren't right. a lot. And the issue we're running to with the digital simulation is how much can you trust a simulation? Because there's so many factors that go into like if I physically crash apart, I'm much more confident in that because I've simulated the environment it's going to be in much more. Uh, with higher fidelity than I can with the digital simulation at this point because you can include the ground, velocity. There's other little things that may not be picked up in the simulation. So there is a uh, point in the future where we are doing more closed loop. So I have a digital simulation, I crash a thing, and then I compare the results, and then I iterate from there on the next design. Uh, and I see that growing, because to your point, why do I need to crash five, four, uh, $1.5 million cars yeah. when I can Why get to we done this better and just do one of them. Well, but then again, I have no issues with their current <laughs> safety requirements. The way that yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> I'm not going to get into that. I'll get in trouble. If we Let's get, get into, into safety stuff. Chrome. My last article. Okay, so I wanted to get into Chrome because of you know talking about like the shiny coatings on the new NGED program F22, but it was brought to my attention late last week. Um, from Tim, it's like, hey, there's this huge thing, a ban on Chromium 6 right. that has, like, taken over Europe and, like, everybody, supposedly everybody is, like, shifting away from any use of Chromium 6 whatsoever. And this was kind of news to me. It's, right. it's really not that new because it's been all over Europe for a while and it's now coming over to the U.S. Um, but Chromium 6... Um, chrome or chromium with six electrons, uh, a hexavalent chromium, yep. or meaning there are six electrons uh, uh, orbiting the chromium nucleus, um, is apparently pretty. It's it's like our generation because because the world isn't tough enough right now. <laughs> um, the newest bestest on the block is chromium six. It's, okay. it's the easiest way to put it. Sure, that's fair. Um, it's used everywhere. It's used a lot. It is used everywhere. <laughs> Even though, like you know, like I was just saying, style trends in automotive right. and, and motorcycles have gone totally away from chrome. Yep. Um, it was for the better because yeah. it is awful for you. And chrome is. Resilient. It's used more of like anti-abrasion material. It's, so it's, it's great to line barrels yeah. of weapons. Yeah, yeah. You want a resistant barrel that can put a lot of stuff down range? Yeah. Line it with chrome. Yeah. And it's easy to clean. Easy to clean. But it's carcinogen. Correct. Um, now, Tim wanted me to look into chromium six, the ban on the European ban on chromium six, because he wanted to see if it was going to affect our industry. Uh -huh. He. he 
he wanted to see if there if, if we need to do an article to determine its effect on on our industry yep. our, our, a, a businessy article and I learned pretty quickly that you know, comparing to other things that our the in- manufacturing industry has run into, this will be a minor speed bump, but okay. we'll brush it right off. Sure. Like, I That's mean, good. we've got a, we've got much bigger problems right now, <laughs> uh, like you know, silicon shortage sure. and oh yeah, the sure. supply chain. Right. Um, but uh, oh man, we can't get our hands on chromium six. Good, we don't want it. <laughs> um, so so yeah, we're gonna brush this off. That's good. Um. However, there are other industries that are not. Right. So the article that I found, one of the first things that I thought of when ben, or Tim and I had this meeting was, dude, wait a minute. Cro- so I, I read that the ban on Chromium 6 will effectively be a ban on Chromium 3 as well. Okay. Because going back to the electrons and the valence shells of uh, the atoms, Chromium 3 only has three electrons, but you've got to another valence shell of the atom that it can easily take on three more electrons. If right. you have start with chromium three, it can easily become chromium six, right. the bad one. <laughs> so by by default, we also need to put a ban on chromium three. Right. Guess who uses chromium three? Everybody. <laughs> of course. <laughs> chromium three. Like like how many leather products are out there today? Everything. A, a <laughs> lot of things use leather. Sure. Um, and n- because of the speed of production and manufacturing on things, we don't have time to oak bark tan leather hides the mm-hmm. old ways. We use chrome to oh. tan leather. Fascinating. So a lot of leather out there, if it's even real leather, <laughs> is chrome tanned leather. Interesting. Uh, one of the big ones, one of the most popular chrome tanned hides available is from Chicago, mm-hmm. U.S., a Chrome XL made by the Horween Leather Company. Yep. And it uses Chromium 3. I don't mean to show, throw them under the bus. I'm not. It's not my intention. I love Horween. Um, and, but it means the products are going to get better <laughs> since oak bark tan, vegetable tanning yep. is better for the leather. It's a little bit more expensive, takes more time, um, but it is better quality. Uh, but it's going to affect... All of the leather goods, everything that taps into the leather goods industry. Wow. And the article that I have is um, from Visor Down, okay. uh, a motorcycle uh, okay. news outlet. Alpine Stars, a motorcycle clothing company, a, a safety clothing company. Very big um, company. Huge company. Yeah. Oh, they also do auto racing, too. Yep. Uh, like like, like uh, um, Nomex shoes and gloves for, for car racing. Um, Alpine Stars recalls the GP Plus gloves containing cancer-causing chromium-6. And before anybody thinks that this is demonizing Alpine Stars for using chromium-6 in their gloves, because, again, chromium-6 is the asbestos of our time, everybody is using it. It's not just (laughs) Alpine Stars. Right. Everybody that uses natural leather, real leather, not pleather, not that synthetic vegan stuff, which is just plastic <laughs> that's going to end up swirling around in our oceans, uses chromium, ta- chrome tanned leather. Right. So it's not just Alpine Stars, and it's already making an impact. From the moment I heard about this last week, it is already screwing things up. <laughs> so I don't think it's going to affect the, manu- the metal cutting, metal removal, right. manufacturing industry. It's going to affect every other industry, though. Yeah. This is crazy. And it's interesting. You know, I was thinking about that also, uh, like um, sewing needles. I mean, things where those are probably... Paper chrome. clips. Paper, there's a lot of things that are... Do you uh, think paper clips are made out of steel to look all <laughs> silvery and metal like that? No. It's a yeah. cheap, uh, awful, like, bronze alloy yeah. that's coated or plated in chrome right. uh, to look like it's steel yeah. or iron. So within our uh, equipment, I'm glad to see that there probably is an impact on, uh, you know, producing manufacturing equipment. They're probably not using too many chrome, uh, chrome line parts. Uh, and it's also good to see that, you know, if you're pro- if you're a manufacturer, having not having the ability not to process chrome parts anyway, because yeah. one d- processing chrome in general is very it's a hard hard yeah, right. material. So anything you're kind of coating and then grinding afterwards, 
that that's a terrible like, like nobody is making a product or a part out of billet chrome <laughs> that's not a <laughs> correct, thing correct the b- good news for our industry is chrome is only a post production like coating material usually yeah and yeah, usually usually yeah. i'm not going to speak for all of it but i i think we're going to our industry manufacturing is going to brush this off good the rest of the world not so much man good luck tanning industry Leather tent, not to, <laughs> to heck with them. <laughs> Steve, this is a great episode. Where can they find more info about us? AMTonline.org slash resources. See you there. I'd like to thank our sponsor, AM Radio. Okay. And bye, everyone. Bye.